black women have done amazing things to better our community. So guess what, black women? We need you to do an amazing thing right now. We need you to do amazing work right now around the science of black breast cancer. We need you to go to our website, whenwetrial.org, and we have a wealth of information about the basics of clinical trials and why it's so important. We need for you to know your bodies. We need for you to talk about this with your children. Talk about this with your daughters, your sisters, your mamas, and the men in your family. We need you to be committed to knowing how important this science is. We don't want to die anymore. We don't want anyone to die. We need to advance the science. Black women deserve better science, better care, and better drugs. Welcome to a very special episode of The Doctor Is In. I'm Lakia Belcher, a 15th month metastatic breast cancer thriver. Ricky and Dr. Mo asked me to host this show to bring attention to black breasties like me who need better science. Joining us today are breastie Karen Peterson, the 21 year breast cancer survivor, patient navigator manager at Duke Cancer Institute and co-founder of TOUCH, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance. Valerie works tirelessly to support and inform breast cancer patients every day to help them survive breast cancer. Dr. Monique Gary is a breast surgical oncologist and a medical director of Grandview Health Penn Cancer Network Cancer Program in Sellersville, PA, where she also serves as a director of breast program. As a physician and advocate and expert on health and healthcare disparities, she is passionate about developing integrative, holistic, and innovative approaches to cancer treatment, prevention, and general awareness. Ricky Fairley is a 10-year triple negative breast cancer survivor and the co-founder and CEO of Touch, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance. She's on a mission to eradicate breast cancer. And our moderator, April Ryan. She is the longest standing African-American female White House correspondent celebrating 25 years for the GRIO. Today, Touch, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance, BreastCancer.org, and our entire breasty community are proud to launch a movement to advance breast cancer science for black women. Welcome to a conversation on one of the most important topics you will take part of. The doctor is in. And we're talking about breast cancer science for black women. It's important. The stats are in. Valerie, what are the stats when it comes to black women and the mortality rate as it relates to breast cancer? April, thank you so much for asking that question. I think we struggle kind of when we look at those numbers, but we know that annually 200,000 women, over 200,000 women are diagnosed with cancer. Of that, 40,000 women die. Can you imagine that? 40,000 women die, and African American women die at a 41% higher rate than white women. That is scary, that is frightening, and we have to do something about that. So, does that mean that black women, African American women, this is the number one cause of death? When we look at cancer, yes, absolutely it is. And it impacts us at an earlier age. And so even before we even think about childbearing age and all of that, we are being impacted with breast cancer. Ricky, I saw some stats saying that even before black women are told to go get a mammogram, we're seeing numbers of black women yeah. incurring issues of breast cancer. They're dealing with breast cancer. Is that true? Yes. You know, April, black women under the age of 35 get breast cancer at twice the rate of white women and die at three times the rate of white women. And we often don't get our first mammogram till age 40 and in some places age 50. So it's well before they even think about breast health. The three of you on this panel are survivors breast cancer survivors and I read the bios and two of you were given um, very low chance of life. You had less than 4% chance. And what were your Ka numbers? Karen, Karen. I, was less, I was diagnosed with stage 4 triple negative breast cancer and given a 4% chance of survival. 
Mm -hmm. And the three of you are here. We're here. Yes. And that's, that's a blessing. Praise God. Yeah. But in our conversations, you were talking about some things that it's kind of foreign to a lot of people. Yeah. Advocacy, self-advocacy in the midst of a life sentence to a certain extent. You fought to survive in the midst of the tears of finding out. You said, I'm going to survive. It's not going to be my will. It's going to be my action. Talk to me about what advocacy is and why it's important for yourself when you're going through this. So oftentimes when we are diagnosed, we don't know enough about breast cancer and it's a stigma in the African American community. So if we're not learning this so that we can share with our community, again, we sit in front of a doctor and we're not informed and we can't make informed decisions. Karen, how did you find out? How did I find out I had stage four triple negative breast cancer? Yeah. It was via a routine blood test. Uh, there was something that was off. And so at that point, um, the doctor recommended that I have a CAT scan. And I can remember being very belligerent because I didn't want to do it because I'd already been through standard of care with stage one triple negative breast cancer. So I was like, that's not something I want to do, but I'll do it anyway. And when it came back, it came back that there was activity, but there was no definitive diagnosis. I had to go and get a biopsy. And at that point, I said, science is going to help me change my narrative. I'm not going to make any emotional decisions. Every decision moving forward is going to be based off science. Wait a minute. You said, and this is important, I'm not going to make any emotional decision especially as emotion takes over our being right. when we're given this, Ricky. Fear. Fear. Fear takes yes. over. How do you go through this blinding fear and say, I'm going to fight? Because reading your story, I said that you, you, were, you were given two years. Two years to live. My and you're now 10. You're, I'm you're, 10. Yep, I'm a blessing. I'm a miracle. You are. Um, and my, my motivation was my daughter. My baby daughter was a sophomore at Dartmouth, and I had to pay tuition and get my child through school. So when my doctor said, you have two years to live, I said, no, you don't really understand. I can't really die right now. I got to make it till my daughter graduates from college, so me, you, and God need to work this out. Mm -hmm. But I had to go and get another doctor. I realized my doctor wasn't doing the job. She wasn't educated enough to give me the care that I needed. And so I went and found a specialist in triple negative, which at the, 10 years ago was really a blip on the radar screen, even with doctors. And she'd only had two patients before me, and they both died in nine months. And so that was her, her personal experience with them. And so when she told me she was going to die, she really didn't know what she was talking about. And I couldn't accept it. I refused to. And I had to fight for, advocate and fight for myself to get better care. It's interesting, you know, when you say the doctor didn't know much about it and her, her track record she already had two people that had the same disease right. that you had, and they had passed. Right. But you chose to go further because we hear sometimes that when you try to advocate for yourself, oh, no, no, I understand what's going on. And then you're chastised for moving on. Did you encounter that at all? That I didn't care. Mm. I didn't care. I wouldn't accept it. You know, I was, you know, when you know that mama bear came out in me that I had to take care of my child. It's about that, my children, not about me. Exactly. Yeah. It's about my child. And so I had to figure out how to fix it. Yeah. Karen, you're shaking your head, nodding your head like. <laughs> this story sounds so familiar. I often talk to patients and hear this same story day after day. It can be very intimidating to talk to a doctor because in our culture, we right. are taught to you know, recognize authority and the doctor is got the best right. word and the say in when it comes to the care. But at the same time, it's very important to become educated. It's very important to trust your inner voice. If you feel yes. like something's wrong, you deserve a second opinion. It's not something that's so obtainable. A second opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. Grabbing information, getting that inf education. It's nothing wrong with that. You shouldn't feel guilty about stepping out to go and get a second opinion, like you're, you know, stepping out on your partner or you're cheating on your man. No, you're actually going to see about what options are there, right. what options are possible. It's all about possibilities. And there are options. There are always options. Always options. You said something, Karen, so critical. You said in our culture, we are taught 
to respect authority in our culture. But there is a mistrust to a certain extent as we respect the authority of those who have gone through medical school, who know way more than we do beyond our home remedies of what we think is going on. Talk to me about that mistrust and how do we advocate in a way that does not knock the doctor, but yet support us to live. Karen hit something, our culture, our culture, that is something so deep. I think that one thing, as survivors, we have to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I can advocate for myself unless I look at two representatives that did that. And unless we're telling our story, then we can't be strong and we can't advocate. And then secondly, yes, there's a history. We think about Tuskegee and we think about Henrietta Lacks. That's true. I'm not denying that, but we have to move past that, but then understand that there are things in place now. There are so many things, they inform consent. We have boards that look at the clinical trials. They watch the safety, the side effects. All of these things are present. And so when we stand before that oncologist and we say, we want a second opinion, is there something else that you can do? What is beyond the standard? Then we should stand with confidence and believe that that individual is going to give us the truth. And if he can't provide that, then we have an option of going somewhere else. And we have to have that faith and confidence. Advocacy is important, especially yeah. as this is the number one killer of black women in mm -hmm. this nation. I said black women. I mean, we hear at the White House that they're dealing with a topic that people haven't really openly talked about, uh, you know, uh, black uh, maternal health. Right. It took a long time for that to happen. Right. Now, when is it going to happen when we're hearing about these numbers of black women dying of breast cancer on Capitol Hill and at the White House? When? Yeah, we're, we're trying to start those conversations, April. We've, we've got a lot of, you know, there's several congresswomen who are breasties who've had yes. breast cancer. And so we're starting those conversations like with Sheila Jackson Lee. And, and, um, and we're trying to make, you know, make policy around and make the issue known about the state of black breast cancer. But it's, you know, it's hard when they're dealing with, you know, all the stuff that's in politics that you're so well aware of, right? This is like a blip on the radar screen. And, and um, but our mortality rates are just outrageous. They're unacceptable. And, and I don't want any woman to die of breast cancer, but black women deserve mortality rate parity. Mm. We shouldn't have this. And, and what we know about the science is that the drugs that are available have either they've never been tested on black women or we don't have the data about that. And it's really scary that we don't have the science that we need and we deserve to get the care that we need. So let's talk about this, the trials. So after we get the second opinion, maybe even the third or fourth, because I've heard people go down yes. the line. It's yes. not just two no. opinions, because when they're differing opinions, you say, well, this yes. one said this and that one said that. I need to get another. Right. So, you know, you want a consensus. So once you do that, then there's the option of the trial. Let's get into that. Let's go into the weeds of that. The trial, and I'm gonna say this, I've heard all of my life, I had one of those mothers um, who would always talk about black history. You know, Tuskegee, Henrietta Lacks. Um, she brought up Charles Drew, blood mm -hmm. plasma. Mm -hmm. She would talk to me about us, the greatness of us. But in the midst of the greatness of us, there are concerns about us with the trials. Right. History has shown us that we have been guinea pigs. What is different now when it comes to these trials? I understand that there are international standards, number one, that these trials have to stand by, and also stricter standards in the United States looking back from lessons learned. Talk to me about these trials, any of yeah. you. That'll probably have our yeah, so I think there's a, a lot of safety measures that are placed now that weren't years ago. Mm -hmm. um, there's no more sugar peel. I think uh, you did a study, Ricky, where people actually thought in 2021 that they're still given the sugar pill. Now let's explain what the sugar pill is. The sugar pill is the placebo. Uh, right. They thought that that is the placebo versus the actual drug. So you go into a trial, you'll get the actual one person, well, depending upon how you're selected, you'll get either the sugar pill, which is nothing, or you'll get 
the, the drug okay. that is meant to help you. So there's no more sugar pill. There's no said. sugar pill in no. cancer research. Okay. There's no sugar pill. What we got, what we get is standard of care. Standard of care means the drugs that are currently available on the market. So you're going to get a drug that already exists, right, that people are taking that's sort of in the, in the, in the scope of, of possibilities of drugs that are available or a new drug that could potentially save your life. And so you're never going to be without care. Okay, you're never going to be without care. Okay, so I'm going to throw this in really fast, um, but we're going to take a break because this, this issue of clinical trials and black America, particularly black women, is something that we have to delve into. Um, it's a hot topic. We'll be back after this. An important conversation. This is not just a conversation about women, right. black women. It's a conversation about our community, but black women, this is the number one issue. Black women are not alone. Breast cancer is not just a woman's issue. And the mortality rates for black men are 66% higher than white men. And you can get breast cancer from, um, from your dad. Right. Let's say if your dad had prostate cancer, then that predisposes the daughter really? to breast cancer. Yes. Say that again. So yes. if the dad had prostate cancer, that predisposes the daughter to breast cancer. So there's a large swath of black women in this nation because many black men are getting, have, prostate. Are mm -hmm. getting prostate cancer. Right. And we are each other's keepers. We're in this together. Welcome back to the Doctors in Breast Cancer Science for Black Women, an important conversation. And believe it or not, many of us are touched by breast cancer. If you don't have it or haven't had it, you know someone who has, particularly a black woman. My aunt and my great aunt, I know in my community, um, suffered from breast cancer. Many of us have been touched by breast cancer. And this is an important conversation, as I said, one of the most important conversations that you will be listening to because it will teach you how to advocate for yourself or it will help you help someone else advocate for themselves, particularly if it's a black woman. Now, I want to go back to the, the clinical trial issue. I'm going to throw something out that's very controversial, and I want you to breathe through it. <laughs> You've been through a lot already, so you're going to breathe through this one. Clinical trials, and you were talking about there is no sugar pill. That's great to know. It's a standard of care. You will be treated no matter what. But people are also thinking about clinical trials as it relates to our current situation, COVID. Mm -hmm. in, these clinical, in these clinical trials, either you receive the vaccination that saved your life or you didn't. And there were some that did pass away from not receiving the vaccination. What do you say to people who challenge you on that very fact when you're advocating for clinical trials and we see what's happened with COVID? And then there are other clinical trials that, you know, I think about sickle cell. They either give them the treatment to stop the pain that ultimately will help them not be drug addicts because they try to feed the, the, the pain with some type of medication or, or a drug. And then those who don't get it suffer. It's a standard of care, but they still suffer. How do you go and combat those types of thoughts in your efforts to advocate for clinical trials? With clinical trials, especially with advanced cancer, there's only 5% of it. African-American patients with advanced cancer that participate in clinical trials. Only metastatic breast cancer kills you. What, what I will say is this. Standard of care is not going to disappear. Chemotherapy is not going anywhere. Yeah. Radiation is not going anywhere. But the window of opportunity to join a clinical trial and possibly save your life when I was given 4% chance was very small. There were only 20 to 30 slots. I was the first person in the nation to join the trial. They had opened it up to triple negative breast cancer. We weren't even invited. And they finally said, well, come on in. Let's see if it'll work for you. The first person in the trial, and you are a black woman. Yes. When the black community says, whoa, hold up, clinical trials. We have a history with clinical trials. You were the first person in the I nation. 
and it was based off science. Mm -hmm. It wasn't based off emotion. Again, there were certain biomarkers, there were certain testing, genomic testing, genetic testing, that clearly identified that this clinical trial was going to be the best option for me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something I said, you know what, I'm just gonna, it's time, it's five o'clock, I'm gonna join a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was very tactical, it was very science-based. It had nothing to do with emotion. And in order to be able to do that, I had to become educated. I had to become an advocate for myself. I had to understand what an informed decision is. And that's all we want, is an opportunity to make an informed decision, each and every one of us, when it comes to our, our treatment. Care. Yeah. Yeah. Taking the emotion out of it saved your life. Mm -hmm. Taking, and that's hard for a lot of it. Again, I keep going back to that, but you looked at the science, you took the emotion out of it. But Ricky, there are people who will say, okay, I want to get in a clinical trial, but they cannot. Talk to me about that. Well, they, you know, the trials do have specific requirements, for bit, and it is based on your genetics, your genomics, your body type, the type of cancer you have. And so there is a matching process you have to go through. But again, in cancer research, you will have a therapy. You will have something. You're never going to be, it's not, it's not like COVID. It's not like a placebo drug. There isn't. You're going to get some sort of therapy, and you could get what's happening now or something that could be new and different and save you. So I think we just have to help people understand that you're going to get care, and you're going to get better care. You're going to get more scans. You're going to get better attention. You're going to get more, more support through the process mm -hmm. than even a normal patient would because the doctors want to see what's going on with your body. Yeah. Um, but there is a lot of science put into it, and we spend a lot of time helping our patients figure out how to find trials that will work for them. We have a great partner that we work with called Citizen, um, and they help match patients to trials. And it's all made based on your body type. Like even now that I'm cancer-free, I get a I get an email every month that tells me all the trip the the trials that fit my body type within a 50 mile radius of, our, of my house. So how many trials are you in? Since you're getting every month, you get yeah, this no, list of trials. So I'm actually in two trials oh, right really? now, and okay. not for drugs, but for behavior. So really? there's all kinds of clinical mm -hmm. trials. They're not all drug related, but I'm, I'm in a trial on, on basically how um, black, breast, black breast cancer patients deal with stress. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's being conducted by Georgetown and Howard. And um, I did a trial a couple of months ago on just the chemicals that are in my environment and how they affect a, a breast cancer survivor. So there's all kinds of trials. And because I'm really dedicated to walking this walk, I will sign up for any trial just to really? figure out, yes, just to <laughs> understand the science. You say, because, sign me up. Yes, okay. <laughs> and yes, I, want to, um, I want to advance the science for black women in any way that I can. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to put myself out there right now with trials. My mother. My late mother, she died 14 years ago of uh, AML leukemia. But she was at Johns Hopkins, and she said, you know, they gave her three months, and she had six months. And she was part of a trial for a new drug for cancer. She said, I want, a, I want my life to make, a difference. to make a difference, and I want to help someone. And it's so interesting. And she, was, and she was the one who told me about all those medical stories from years ago, but she wanted to help someone else. And that touched my heart. And on a personal note, another personal note, during COVID, um, I had been prescribed some kind of medication that did not work well for me. I had something called Stephen Johnson's. By the grace of God, they caught it early. And with that said, um, I'm allergic to some medicines. Mm -hmm. And when it came time for a COVID test, they said, you should get in the trial so they can monitor you to make sure you're okay. I was desperately running for the mismatch trial at the University of Maryland. But by the time um, the mismatch effort came out, the trial was not, they didn't even call me. So I, I get the point of trials. I get the push for trials. So at the end of the day, when we talk about breast cancer in black women, trials and advocacy, is it really something that we are seeing an increase in with women going for trials now, or are we still, is it, is it flatlined, or are we seeing an upward movement on this? I think it's kind of flatlined. Yes. And, I, I, and I think there, there are two reasons. One, on one side, we're still frightened. We, you know, clinical trials are still hocus pocus to some of us, mm. and I have a whole, you know, definition that Ricky and I talk about all the time. Give me that definition. Um, so, 
you're going to be on a trial either formally or not. So if you think about aspirin and Excedrin and all, someone was on a clinical trial. And typically, the person that, it, that is enrolls in a clinical trial is a 50-year-old white man. And that's based on an age and a weight. So we all take Excedrin based on uh -huh. that weight. So and when, a lot of these over-the-counter drugs, before they became over-the-counter, they, they were all, they were all prescription drugs. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And so it, the beauty of being on a trial is they record all of your side effects. But when that trial closes, then it's not recorded. So any side effects that we as African Americans have will never be recorded. Absolutely never be because the trial is closed. Mm -hmm. But then the other part of this is that when people are crafting the trials mm -hmm. and their exclusion criteria, meaning if you have this, this, and this, you can't be a part of it, oftentimes it's if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes. So what do we have as African Americans? Everything. Uh -huh. Everything, and Everything. so that excludes us. Uh -huh. So for those of us sometimes that want it, because of exclusion uh, criteria, we can't enroll. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's damned if we do, damned if we don't almost. So there are advocates that are fighting to say, is it really necessary that it's all people that are diabetics or all people that have high blood pressure? Can't we at least say, if your blood sugar is, or A1C is this number, then we can accept you. Or if your blood pressure is between this and this, we can accept you. Yep. Because we're losing. Those exclusionary criteria are very tricky. It's even to the point where if you've had too many lines of treatment, you cannot be in a clinical trial. Really? They will exclude you, yes. I was very mindful and very tactical to understand that exclusionary criteria when I was looking at the clinical trial. And I can remember my very first physician, very first oncologist, was offering something up. And I was like, um, you do realize that if I get treated too many times, that will exclude me from the clinical trial. I can remember her response was, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you really have to understand way before you even start because there's so much science that goes into it and, and many patients are excluded because they've had too many treatments. So and when you're, and you're sick when you're dealing with this, you're sick. You're sick. You're not feeling well physically and emotionally. It's crazy. The, but the other thing, April, is that the drugs that are currently available, the standard of care drugs, if you go back in history, a lot of them were developed in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And we don't even have data about how many black women were in those trials and how they performed in those trials. Mm -hmm. So frankly, as a black woman, every time we take a chemo drug, mm -hmm. it's a clinical trial in your own body because mm -hmm. we don't have enough history in the science to know whether it's going to work on black women. So everything that we all took, when we took it for the first time for our bodies, it was a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. So it's no different. I mean, you know, we think it because other people are taking it, but guess what? Black women are dying at a 41% higher rate. So there's got to be something wrong with the, with the drugs for our bodies. And what is the likelihood, uh, Ricky, Karen, and, and, and Valerie, of a black woman getting breast cancer? So black mm. women are incidents overall is one in eight women will get breast cancer. Say that again. One in eight women, all mm -hmm. colors, all shapes, all sizes, mm -hmm. will get breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So there's, so the incidence is the same. The difference in, between black women and white women is the mortality oh rate. Exactly. So we are 41% more likely to die. There's another devastating statistic for, for black women like us who've had breast cancer, our relative risk of death is 71% higher than white women. And that's a frightening thought. So it's really in the mortality. Now, for black women, young black women, the numbers are, the incidence is way higher. So black women under 35, I said this earlier, get breast cancer at twice the rate of white women and die at three times the rate. So if you're younger, and, and we're getting it younger, we're getting triple negative breast cancer at mm -hmm. young ages. Triple negative breast cancer is the most yeah. Uh, most more, has highest yeah. mortality and most everything. We've and those had stats that. are frightening. Frightening. Under 35. I'm one of 12 percent. I'm a five-year survivor as of 2022. There are only 12 percent of triple metastatic, triple negative breast cancer patients that make it to the five-year mark. Yeah. That is a cruddy, sorry, disgusting stat. Yeah. That was emotion succinctly placed. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that really? is, it's an ugly stat. Um, it's, it's, I think about so many young women that I attended college with, and I've heard so many have died from They're breast gone. cancer. And I've never, you, when you're growing up, you don't hear, but I guess we are more communicative now, mm -hmm. and we're talking about it. But with that said, you, again, I go back to the numbers, and then here in Washington, D.C., 
Oh, yes. Why is this not an issue on Capitol Hill and at the White House? Why is it? Well, I don't know, but you know, we have an HBCU internship program at Touch, and um, um, we had 15 interns last year. And what we learned was we asked the girls, too, they're all pre-med, brilliant, these brilliant young women, and we asked them to have a conversation with their moms and their best friends about breast health. Do you know how to do a self-exam? Have you ever had a mammogram, et cetera? And in every instance of these 15 girls, it was the first conversation they had with their mom about their breasts. Mm -hmm. The first conversation they had with their girlfriend about their breasts. We are not talking about it. We are not talking about it with our children. We are not talking with our young women. And, and annual mammograms. Annual mammograms. I We're just not had one. About it. Yeah, I just had one in 3D, especially. And now, yes. one thing I do know for sure: 3D. Black women. Get 3D. Yes, you have to get 3D. We um, are more cystic, uh, more dense, 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 more dense yes. than our white counterparts. And you, it can hide in that That's denseness. Yes. There we go. Point. I just had a. I can. I'm going to be honest. Many point. of us, we don't like being manipulated under mm -hmm. right. that thing. But it's to save your it's life. To save your life. It's to be here point. for your children yes. and your grandchildren. Right. Because we got to pay for college. We got to pay for college. We got to take care of these babies. We got to take care of these. I work for my granddaughters. <laughs> yeah. Right. I work for my granddaughters. So, so the first thing, a mam, an annual mammogram. Yes. Annual. And breast check. And Let's check your breasts monthly. Mm -hmm. You you need to know your girls. You need to know your body. Your you need, girls, okay. You need to stand in front of the mirror and look at them and touch them and know what they feel like because a lot, a lot of times with young women, they'll feel a lump, feel something unusual. They'll go to the doctor and present with a lump, and the doctor will say, oh, you're too young for a mammogram. It's no big deal. Come back in six months. And they come back six months later with yes, metastatic yes, right. triple negative yes. breast cancer. because And they don't know how to advocate for themselves. So we need to educate young women about this and have have them talk about it and know their bodies. And that point you made about dense breasts, it's very important. Yes. If you have dense breasts, get an ultrasound. Don't yes. stop just at the mammogram. 3D. 3D, 3D is important. Right. 3D yes. is important. Yes. Yeah. Ladies, as I said, this is one of the most important conversations, if not the most important conversation that we could have because this conversation will save a life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Valerie, Karen, and Ricky, Thank you so much for being open and talking about your survival. Five years, you're cancer free, they say. And you live each day grateful and thankful. And we thank you for your advocacy. Mm -hmm. We thank you for your test that gave us your testimony. Yeah. Mm. Ladies, you're awesome. Mm. The besties who are breasties. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? The besties who are breasties. We love it. We love it. Black History, Tuskegee, Henrietta Lacks, us, the greatness of us. But in the midst of the greatness of us, there are concerns about us with the trials. History has shown us that we have been guinea pigs. What is different now when it comes to these trials? Let's continue the conversation. We're going to our babies. I've got two girls. And I think about what my mother used to do for me. She worked at Morgan State University, and she used to bring home these little kits that they would give the young women on the campus. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the material was, but it was a breast, and it had a lump in it. And you could feel the hardness of the lump. And that was my beginning knowledge of breast cancer. How do we detect breast cancer for us? It's self-check. And I understood from that little piece of, of plastic that had that lump in it what to feel for. And it taught us not just to hit the breast, but under the arm. And, and Valerie, you said, under your what we call the clavicle, your shoulder. All, you need to go all the way up. Your breast tissue goes up. You know, we think it stops like, at the bra line, but it doesn't. So we have to check here and, as you said, under your arm, April. Karen, um, how important is it for our babies to know what to do? I'm somebody's baby. I'm an old baby, but I'm somebody's baby. My grandmother passed away from metastatic breast and ovarian cancer at the age of 44. Mm. I knew that. I watched her go through it, so I was always very mindful. 
When I was diagnosed with cancer, was going through my treatment, I can remember my nieces, I have three of them, coming to visit. My middle niece, the teenager, um, two moons, she said to me, oh, Mommy told me you have, and she tried to whisper it, and I said, it's okay. Say the word, it's all right. I, you have to help them help themselves, mm -hmm. because it's frightening, it's it emotional. Is. They don't wanna talk about it. You have to encourage the conversation because their lives may depend on it. Their auntie was diagnosed with a special kind of breast cancer. 15% mm -hmm. of women right. diagnosed with breast cancer get triple negative breast cancer. They need to know this information. They need to be mindful of their grand great grandmother passed away from metastatic breast cancer. Their auntie is surviving with metastatic breast cancer. They need to be mindful of that. They need to have that there. So at 19, 20, 21, 22, they're armed with this, this, this information and they are aware that this is something they should think about and this is something that they should look for every time they walk into that doctor's office just for a physical exam. Yeah. So we, call, we call it knowing your her story. Mm. And a lot of women will think, say, well, my mom didn't have breast cancer, so I'm okay. And that is not the case. Now, really, only about 5% of breast cancers are hereditary but, or genetic, but there's, we don't know any, again, have the science for black women. We don't know about triple negative, you know, where it came from. I had, um, my great aunt um, died at 42. We don't know what, what kind of breast cancer she had because it was, you know, in the 50s. So, but knowing your her story, talking to your mom, talking to your aunties, talking to your grandma, mm -hmm. just so that you know what, what if, there is a, if there is a genetic history, you can get tested right. for it and, and act prophylactically about it. But having the conversations is so important. And your mom was a blessing. Most moms aren't doing that. They're not bringing the, the fake boob home. They're not talking to their girls. Mm -hmm. And so we really want, that's why we, we, we have an HBCU internship program because we want the girls to talk about it. We want young women to talk about it. Tell me about that HBCU internship program. That's important because like I said earlier, I am in my 50s and I am shocked at the numbers that I have of classmates that I'm hearing that are dying from breast cancer. And I attended an HBCU. Yeah. Um, we have a, a precious, precious breastie. Her name is Ariana Apodaco. She is, um, um, she got triple negative age 19. It came back at age 20. Um, she just finished her, her last treatment and she just graduated from college and she now runs our internship program. Mm -hmm. But she's our poster child for a young woman with breast cancer and she's not alone and she, is amazing at coaching our, our interns on terms of how to talk about it with young women, how to talk about it with their friends. But she, you know, she is a blessing, but she's, you know, she's not unusual. I mean, women are getting this disease at really young ages and they need to know their body so that, you know, she had the wherewithal when she felt a lump to go get it checked out because she was a pre, pre med student. And so she had health in her, in her mindset. Mm -hmm. But if you're an English major, you may not be thinking about it you know, what your body feels like. I used to see a lot of commercials on self-exams. Why, uh, Karen was like, yeah. Mm. Yeah. why are go. we not seeing those? I mean, I used to see self-exams yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Why are we not seeing that? And are doctors supporting self-exams? Um, not exactly. And I think what we hear and what we've been reading is that they're fearful that women will find something and they'll get needless biopsies and then that worries them. and. So the, when you look at the numbers, the amount of biopsies that are done and the cancers that are found, um, according to some schools of thought, it's, it's not worth it for the many of biopsies that are done and maybe you find one cancer. So is it, is it really worth women worrying needlessly about a biopsy that may not be cancerous? Um, I think that's just a slippery slope I think there are other ways that we can wordsmith that so that people are aware of their bodies and we know from month to month whether or not there's a change. And so when you say don't check your breast and you're saying don't check yourself at all, I believe that women that do self breast exams, they also get annual mammograms and they're also more aware of their bodies. So we Careful. have to figure out a way to encourage people to continue to do this in spite of. So it's important to be armed with information, self-advocate, self-test yourself, self-exam, and a mammogram. Um, the other thing, April, you know, I can't say this enough, black bodies are different. 
Yeah. So all of these standard of care things that doctors are recommended are based on white women, I'm sorry yeah. to be that blunt about it, but our bodies are different. We're responding differently to drugs. We get a different disease and black breast cancer is different yeah. and we have to address it and black women have to be more aware and more more careful about checking their bodies and knowing our bodies Absolutely. because it's, our disease is different. You're right. Black bodies are different than mainstream. I mean, there are certain diseases we have. Our levels of certain issues are yes. higher than mainstream. We are different. We are different. different. And we deserve better, different care. Right. We and I think we better science. And we can talk bodies. to people about taking care of themselves and not frightening them. So while we're saying to young people, check your breasts, we can also say exercise and eat better. And that minimizes your risk for so many other things. Yeah. And so then they see that there's a balance. Yeah, we want you to check yourself, but also we want you to take control over your health. Do the and right duties. thing. Do the right, yeah. absolutely, do the right thing. Yeah. And, and I, wanna, I wanna end out on this segment with this. Black women are not alone. No. Black men are also getting breast cancer. Yes. So rephrasing it, I mean, Richard Roundtree right. had breast cancer right. and survived. He's a man. Breast cancer is not just a woman's issue. And the mortality rates for black men are 66% higher than white men. This is not just a conversation about women, right. black mm -hmm. women. It's a conversation about our community. But black women, this is the number one issue where we die from, where right. we die from. Right. So, yeah. And you can get breast cancer um, from your dad. Right. The gene can be passed on right. from your dad. From your yeah. dad. Yes. Yeah. yes. If, 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 um, let's say if your dad had prostate cancer, then that predisposes the daughter Really? To breast cancer. Yes. Say that again. So yes. if the dad had prostate cancer, that predisposes the daughter to breast cancer. So there's a large swath of black women in this nation because many black men are getting have, prostate are mm -hmm. getting prostate cancer right. at way higher rates than white men. We are, you know, we are each other's keepers. So it, for me, all of us being a breast cancer survivor, then that predisposes my brother to have prostate cancer. So we're in this together. It's not my dad had prostate separate. cancer. Yeah. yeah so. Right. 1991 surgery, he was cured, but um, yeah. never came back. But Got to talk about it. An important conversation. We'll be back. You were given two years. Two years to live. And you're now 10. You're, I'm you're, 10. Yep, I'm a blessing. I'm a miracle. You are. Um, and my, my motivation was my daughter. My baby daughter was a sophomore at Dartmouth, and I had to pay tuition and get my child through school. So my doctor said, you have two years to live. I said, no, you don't really understand. I can't really die right now. I got to make it till my daughter graduates from college. So me, you, and God need to work this out. Valerie and I founded Touch to advance the science for black women and black breast cancer. And we can't do that alone. So we are starting today a movement to get people engaged in understanding the importance of clinical trial research. And frankly, you need to know about clinical trial research way before you need a clinical trial. This needs to be a kitchen table conversation in every black household, how the science works and how important it is for, for us to understand our breast health. So our movement is called When We Trial. When We Trial. And we, we talk about how black women have done amazing things in history. Black women have done amazing things in politics. Thank you for that, April. <laughs> black women have done amazing things to better our community. So guess what, black women? We need you to do an amazing thing right now. We need you to do amazing work right now around the science of black breast cancer. We need you to go to our website, whenwetrial.org, and we have a wealth of information about the basics of clinical trials and why it's so important. We need for you to know your bodies. We need for you to talk about this with your children. Talk about this with your daughters, your sisters, your mamas, everybody, everybody in your family, and the men in your family. We need you to be committed to knowing how important this science is. We don't want to die anymore. We don't want anyone to die. But we need to advance the science. Black women deserve better science, better care, and better drugs. I want the drug that you can hold up the bottle and it says, this drug is for black women, for black breast cancer on the label. I want that drug. We're not going to get it until we participate in the science. We need to get over the fears. 
it's not worth the fear anymore. There's a lot of protection for, for this research, and we've got to get engaged. I can't say it enough. And I so thank these wonderful women for being here with us today to talk about this such important topic. Thank you so much for, for what you brought to this conversation. And to my breasty mm, sisters who I adore you. every day. And, you know, we, we're in this together, and, but we need for our community to understand it. We need to be talking about it at church, talking about it at your sorority meeting, talking about your Lynx meeting, talking about it in Jack and Jill, talking about it in colleges and schools, mm -hmm. and at your kitchen table. This, I can't say enough about how important this is. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. I've learned so much today um, in this very important conversation from these three courageous survivors. But what I'm going to take from this is the information, but also I'm going to take my daughters with me like I do to the voting booth when right. they were young. Right. I was taking them to the voting booth to show them what democracy looks like and how to vote. Now I have to take them to a mammogram and show them what has to happen annually, as well as self-exams. Yeah, all Thank right. You. Awesome. All right. The Doctors in Breast Cancer Science for Black Women. I'm April Ryan. Have a great one. Historically, when black women set our minds to solving problems, we always succeed. From freeing slaves to fighting for equity in schools to ensuring the victory of candidates, we have our best interests at heart. We don't try, we do. For years, black women have been dying at an alarming rate from a killer hiding in plain sight, breast cancer. Black women are more likely to die from breast cancer than white women, partially because we are not considered when life-saving cancer drugs are being developed. If we want to change this disturbing reality, we must demand to be included in clinical trials. This is a matter of life and death for black women. And as always, we must count on each other to save ourselves. Eradicating black breast cancer isn't about a month, it's about a movement. When we trial, we set a new standard of care. When we trial, we do it for our daughters. When we trial, we defy the odds.